God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Hello and welcome to a special edition of Craftlet. This year, instead of just getting a Christmas carol again, which you can still access, this year we've got the 12 days of Christmas. We will be celebrating the 12 days before Christmas by bringing you some audio that you may never have heard before, but which is very, very Christmas themed. And all of this being public domain literature, that means that some of these stories are going to be a little bit more didactic, a little bit more uh, teachy, (laughs) little moral lessons here and there. Uh, Some of them are just going to be fun. But whether didactic, teachy, or fun, I really hope you enjoy them. So every day between now and Christmas Day, you will find one bit of audio popping up in your feed at craftlit.com or on the Craftlit app or at Stitcher Radio. We're popping up all over the place. You'll be able to get your audio that way. It should all be clean enough to listen to with children, although, as I said, some of them are more wry than others. But they are all clean and family-friendly in that respect. And then in January 2016, we will begin The Count of Monte Cristo. The sudden passing of our normal narrator, John Scholes, really did a number on me. So knowing how much John enjoyed Christmas and recording things for both Halloween and Christmas, and how insistent he was last year to read Twas the Night Before Christmas for you. I thought, well, maybe we should just do a whole 12 days. It will end on Christmas Eve with John reading Twas the Night Before Christmas for you. So today, our first day of our extravaganza, we begin with a small children's story, just a few minutes long, by Anonymous. And then we'll have a piece by Hans Christian Andersen, because Hans Christian Andersen, very important. Uh, If you've never read anything by him before, he was Danish. He lived from 1805 to 1875, and he wrote tons of stuff, and he didn't entirely look like Danny Kay, but that's okay. And then we move into a a short story by a guy named Stephen Leacock, and at the turn of the last century, he was really, really popular for writing humorous pieces. So we have one from him today, and then we'll have one from him later on, on either day 11 or 12. I can't quite remember, and I can't see that note. (laughs) And unlike the regular Craftlet episodes, I'm not going to pre-hash the stories. If there's something particularly important, interesting, or cool about the author, I will post-hash the story and fill you in on that at the end. So, I hope you enjoy our stories today. Come back tomorrow and get more. Here we go with today's stories. The Mouse and the Christmas Cake by Anonymous Read by Rhonda Fetterman A little mouse that built itself a house in a Christmas cake. A pretty story I will tell of Nib, a little mouse who took delight when none were near to skip about the house. Her little nose could sniff and smell where all good things were kept and in the pantry well she knew that Mistress Pussy slept. But notwithstanding, in she crept, and on the shelf she found a Christmas cake, the top of which was by a castle crowned. The subject of the present cake was Windsor's mighty walls, with turrets, windows, standard, too, and entrance to the halls. Why, here within such walls as these, thought Mousy, I could dwell and should the cat lay siege to them, defend myself right well. So with her little teeth, which served for pickaxe and for spade, she gnawed right through the gothic door, and thus an entrance made. 
then climbed the turret which she chose her residence to make, and thought to leave it now and then and feast upon the cake. All this occurred on Christmas Eve, and next came Christmas Day, and then some little folks arrived to eat and drink and play. Right merry are the little folks, and what a noise they make when Windsor Castle they behold displayed upon the cake. The turrets and the walls they view, the cannon too admire, the soldiers ready to present, and then pop, pop, to fire. On this, when they had long enough all exercised their wit, they scrutinize the cake and wish to taste a bit of it. Each guest prepared, the knife was raised, some slices to begin, when lo, with wonder, all exclaimed, I hear a noise within. Poor Mousie, when she saw the knife, at once expressed her fear by squeaking out with all her might, which every one could hear. Then John, as he the turret viewed, with consternation cried, There's something, I am sure, alive and moving, too, inside. All now were hushed and knew not what all this could be about, while Mouse in fright forgot her tail, which at the top popped out. Why, here's some trick, the lady cried. I'll knock the turret down. Mousie in terror gave a leap and ran along her gown. Oh, screamed the lady, what is this? On each side was dismay, which Mousie took advantage of by scampering away. Their fright all o'er, loud laughs ensued from all within the house, to think that so much fear should be caused by a little mouse. The children hunted for this mouse, but she was not adult to wait till she was caught, but made right through a hole, a bolt. The party then began their dance, and singing next ensued, and then came supper with its cakes, and very best home-brewed. THE FIR TREE by Hans Christian Andersen Recording by Elisa McCaslin out in the wood stood a nice little fir tree. The place he had was a very good one. The sun shone on him. As to fresh air, there was enough of that, and round him grew many large-sized comrades, pines as well as firs. But the little fir wanted so very much to be a grown-up tree. He did not think of the warm sun and of the fresh air. He did not care for the little cottage children that ran about and prattled when they were in the woods looking for wild strawberries. The children often came with a whole pitcher full of berries, or a long row of them threaded on a straw, and sat down near the young tree and said, Oh, how pretty he is! What a nice little fir! But this was what the tree could not bear to hear. At the end of a year, he had shot up a good deal, and after another year, he was another long bit taller. For with fir trees, one can always tell by the shoots how many years old they are. Oh, were but I such a high tree as the others are, sighed he, then I should be able to spread out my branches, and with the tops to look into the wide world. Then would the birds build nests among my branches, and when there was a breeze, I could bend with as much stateliness as the others. Neither the sunbeams, nor the birds, nor the red clouds which morning and evening sailed above them, gave the little tree any pleasure. In winter, when the snow lay glittering on the ground, a hare would often come leaping along and jump right over the little tree. Oh, that made him so angry. But two winters were past, and in the third, the tree was so large that the hare was obliged to go round it. To grow and grow, to get older and be tall, thought the tree. That, after all, is the most delightful thing in the world. In autumn, the woodcutters always came and felled some of the largest trees. This happened every year, and the young fir tree that had now grown to a very comely size trembled at the sight, for the magnificent great trees fell to the earth with noise and cracking. The branches were lopped off, and the tree looked long and bare. They were hardly to be recognized, and then they were laid in carts, and the horses dragged them out of the woods. Where did they go to? What became of them? In spring, when the swallows and the storks came, the tree asked them, 
Don't you know where they have been taken? Have you not met them anywhere? The swallows did not know anything about it, but the stork looked musing, nodded his head, and said, Yes, I think I know. I met many ships as I was flying hither from Egypt. On the ships were magnificent masts, and I venture to assert that it was they that smelt so of the fur. I may congratulate you, for they lifted themselves on high most majestically. Oh, were I but old enough to fly across the sea! But how does the sea look in reality? What is it like? That would take a long time to explain, said the stork, and with these words off he went. Rejoice in thy growth, said the sunbeams. Rejoice in thy vigorous growth and in the fresh life that moveth within thee. And the wind kissed the tree, and the dew wept tears over him. But the fir understood it not. When Christmas came, quite young trees were cut down, trees which often were not even as large or of the same age as the fir tree, who could never rest, but always wanted to be off. These young trees, and they were always the finest looking, retained their branches. They were laid on carts, and the horses drew them out of the woods. Where are they going to? asked the fir. They are not taller than I. There was one indeed that was considerably shorter. And why do they retain all their branches? Whither are they taken? We know, we know, chirped the sparrows. We have peeped in at the windows in the town below. We know whither they are taken. The greatest splendor and the greatest magnificence one can imagine await them. We peeped through the windows and saw them planted in the middle of the warm room and ornamented with the most splendid things, with gilded apples, with gingerbread, with toys and many hundred lights. And then, asked the fir tree, trembling in every bough, and then, what happens then? We did not see anything more. It was uncomparably beautiful. I would fain know if I am destined for so glorious a career, cried the tree, rejoicing. That is still better than to cross the sea. What a longing do I suffer. Were Christmas but come. I am now tall and my branches spread like the others that were carried off last year. Oh, were I but already on the cart. Were I in the warm room with all the splendor and magnificence. Yes, then something better, something still grander, will surely follow, or wherefore should they thus ornament me? Something better, something still grander, must follow. But what? Oh, how I long, how I suffer. I do not know myself what is the matter with me. Rejoice in our presence, said the air and the sunlight. Rejoice in thy own fresh youth. But the tree did not rejoice at all. He grew and grew, and was green both winter and summer. People they saw him said, What a fine tree! And toward Christmas he was one of the first that was cut down. The axe struck deep into the very pith. The tree fell to the earth with a sigh. He felt a pang. It was like a swoon. He could not think of happiness, for he was sorrowful at being separated from his home from the place where he had sprung up. He knew well that he should never see his dear old comrades, the little bushes and flowers around him any more, perhaps not even the birds. The departure was not at all agreeable. The tree only came to himself when he was unloaded in a courtyard with the other trees and heard a man say, That one is splendid. We don't want the others. Then two servants came in rich livery and carried the fir tree into a large and splendid drawing room. Portraits were hanging on the walls, and near the white porcelain stove stood two large Chinese vases with lions on the covers. There, too, were large easy chairs, silken sofas, large tables full of picture books and full of toys worth hundreds and hundreds of crowns. At least the children said so and the fir tree was stuck upright in a cask that was filled with sand but no one could see that it was a cask for green cloth was hung all around it and it stood on a large gaily colored carpet oh how the tree quivered what was to happen the servants as well as the young ladies decorated it on one branch there hung little nets cut out of colored paper and each net was filled with sugar plums 
and among the other boughs gilded apples and walnuts were suspended, looking as though they had grown there, and little blue and white tapers were placed among the leaves, dolls that looked for all the world like men. The tree had never beheld such before, were seen among the foliage, and at the very top a large star of gold tinsel was fixed. It was really splendid, beyond description splendid. This evening, said they all, how it will shine this evening. Oh, thought the tree, if the evening were but come, if the tapers were but lighted, and then I wonder what will happen. Perhaps the other trees from the forest will come to look at me. Perhaps the sparrows will beat against the window panes. I wonder if I shall take root here and winter and summer stand covered with ornaments. He knew very much about the matter, but he was so impatient for sheer longing he got a pain in his back, and this with trees is the same thing as a headache with us. The candles were now lighted. What brightness, what splendor! The tree trembled so in every bough that one of the tapers set fire to the foliage. It blazed up splendidly. Help, help, cried the young ladies, and they quickly put out the fire. Now the tree did not even dare tremble. What a state he was in! He was so uneasy lest he should lose something of his splendor that he was quite bewildered amidst the glare and brightness. When suddenly, both folding doors opened, and a troop of children rushed in as if they would upset the tree. The older persons followed quietly. The little ones stood quite still, but it was only for a moment. Then they shouted so that the whole place re-echoed with their rejoicing. They danced round the tree, and one present after the other was pulled off. What are they about, thought the tree? What is to happen now? And the lights burned down to the very branches, and as they burned down they were put out one after the other, and then the children had permission to plunder the tree, so they fell upon it with such violence that all its branches cracked. If it had not been fixed firmly in the cask, it would certainly have tumbled down. The children danced about with their beautiful playthings. No one looked at the tree except the old nurse who peeped between the branches, but it was only to see if there was a fig or an apple left that had been forgotten. A story, a story, cried the children, drawing a little fat man toward the tree. He seated himself under it and said, Now we are in the shade, and the tree can listen too, but I shall tell only one story. Now which will you have, that about Ivity Avity, or about Clumpy Dumpy, who tumbled downstairs and yet after all came to the throne and married the princess? Ivity Avity cried some. Clumpy Dumpy cried the others. There was such a bawling and screaming. The fir tree alone was silent, and he thought to himself, Am I not to ball with the rest? Am I to do nothing whatever? For he was one of the company, and had done what he had to do. And the man told about Clumpy Dumpy, that tumbled down, who notwithstanding came to the throne, and at last married the princess. And the children clapped their hands and cried out, Oh, go on! Do go on! They wanted to hear about Ivity Avity, too, but the little man only told them about Clumpy Dumpy. The fir tree stood quite still and absorbed in thought. The birds in the woods had never related the like of this. Clumpy Dumpy fell downstairs, and yet he married the princess. Yes, yes, that's the way of the world, thought the fir tree, and believed it all, because the man who told the story was so good-looking. Well, well, who knows? Perhaps I may fall downstairs, too, and get a princess as wife. And he looked forward with joy to the morrow, when he hoped to be decked out again with lights, playthings, fruits, and tinsel. I won't tremble tomorrow, thought the fir tree. I will enjoy to the full all my splendor. Tomorrow I shall hear again the story of Clumpy Dumpy, and perhaps that of Ivity Avity too. And the whole night the tree stood still, and in deep thought. In the morning the servant and the housemaid came in. Now then the splendor will begin again, thought the fir. But they dragged him out of the room and up the stairs into the loft and here in a dark corner where no daylight could enter they left him what's the meaning of this thought the tree what am i to do here what shall i hear now i wonder and he leaned against the wall lost in reverie time enough had he too for his reflections for day and nights passed on and nobody came up and when at last somebody did come it was only to put some great trunks in a corner out of the way there stood the tree quite hidden. It seemed as if he had been entirely forgotten. 
"'Tis now winter out of doors,' thought the tree. "'The earth is hard and covered with snow. "'Men cannot plant me now, "'and therefore I have been put up here under shelter "'till the springtime comes. "'How thoughtful that is! "'How kind man is, after all! "'If it only were not so dark here "'and so terribly lonely, not even a hare. "'And out in the woods it was so pleasant "'when the snow was on the ground "'and the hare leaped by, yes, even when he jumped over me. "'But I did not like it then. "'It is really terribly lonely here.' "'Squeak, squeak,' said a little mouse, "'at the same moment, peeping out of his hole, "'and then another little one came. "'They sniffed about the fir tree, "'rustled among the branches. "'It is dreadfully cold,' said the mouse. "'But for that it would be delightful here, old fir, wouldn't it? "'I am by no means old,' said the fir tree. "'There's many a one considerably older than I am.' "'Where do you come from?' asked the mice. "'And what can you do?' "'They were so extremely curious. "'Tell us about the most beautiful spot on the earth. "'Have you never been there? "'Were you never in the larder where cheeses lie on the shelves "'and hams hang from above, "'where one dances about on tallow candles, "'that place where one enters lean and comes out again fat and portly? "'I know no such place,' said the tree. "'But I know the woods, where the sun shines, where the little birds sing.' And then he told all about his youth, and the little mice had never heard the like before, and they listened and said, Well, to be sure, how much you have seen, how happy you must have been. I, said the fir tree, thinking over what he had himself related, Yes, in reality those were happy times. And then he told about Christmas Eve, when he was decked out with cakes and candles. Oh, said the little mice, how fortunate you have been, old fir tree. I am by no means old, said he. I came from the woods this winter. I am in my prime, and am only rather short for my age. What delightful stories you know, said the mice. And the next night they came with four other little mice, who were to hear what the tree recounted. And the more he related, the more plainly he remembered all himself. And it appeared as if those times had really been happy times. But they may still come. They may still come. Clumpy Dumpy fell downstairs, and yet he got a princess, and he thought at the moment of a nice little birch tree growing out in the woods. To the fir, that would be a real charming princess. Who is Clumpy Dumpy? asked the mice. So then the fir tree told the whole fairy tale, for he could remember every single word of it, and the little mice jumped for joy up to the very top of the tree. Next night two more mice came, and on Sunday two rats even, but they said the stories were not interesting, which vexed the little mice, and they too now began to think them not so very amusing either. Do you know only one story? asked the rats. Only that one, answered the tree. I heard it on my happiest evening, but I did not then know how happy I was. It is a very stupid story. Don't you know one about bacon and tallow candles? Can't you tell any larder stories? No, said the tree. Then good-bye, said the rats, and they went home. At last the little mice stayed away also, and the tree sighed. After all, it was very pleasant when the sleek little mice sat around me and listened to what I told them. Now that too is over, but I will take good care to enjoy myself when I am brought out again. But... When was that to be? Why, one morning there came a quantity of people and set to work in the loft. The trunks were moved. The tree was pulled out and thrown, rather hard, it is true, down on the floor. But a man drew him towards the stairs where the daylight shone. Now a merry life will begin again, thought the tree. He felt the fresh air, the first sunbeam, and now he was out in the courtyard. All passed so quickly. There was so much going on around him that the tree quite forgot to look to himself. The court adjoined a garden, and all was in flower. The roses hung so fresh and odorous over the balustrade. The lindens were in blossom. The swallows flew by and said, Queer vit, my husband is come. But it was not the fir tree that they meant. Now then, I shall really enjoy life, said he exultantly, and spread out his branches. But alas! They were all withered and yellow. It was in a corner that he lay, among weeds and nettles. The golden star of tinsel was still on the top of the tree and glittered in the sunshine. In the courtyard some of the merry children were playing, who had danced at Christmas round the fir tree, and were so glad at the sight of him. 
one of the youngest ran and tore off the golden star. "'Only look what is still on the ugly old Christmas tree,' said he, trampling on the branches, so that they all cracked beneath his feet, and the tree beheld all the beauty of the flowers and the freshness in the garden. He beheld himself, and wished he had remained in his dark corner in the loft. He thought of his first youth in the woods of the merry Christmas Eve, and of the little mice who had listened with so much pleasure to the story of Clumpy Dumpy. "'Tis over, tis past," said the poor tree. "'Had I but rejoiced when I had reason to do so, but now tis past, tis past." And the gardener's boy chopped the tree into small pieces. There was a whole heap lying there. The wood flamed up splendidly under the large brewing copper, and it sighed so deeply. Each sigh was like a shot. The boys played about in the court, and the youngest wore the gold star on his breast, which the tree had had on the happiest evening of his life. However, that was over now. The tree was gone. The story at an end. All, all was over. Every tale must end at last. Hoodoo McFiggin's Christmas by Stephen Leacock this reading is by Dave Ranson. This Santa Claus business is played out. It's a sneaking underhand method, and the sooner it's exposed, the better. For a parent to get up under cover of the darkness of night and palm off a ten-cent necktie on a boy who had been expecting a ten-dollar watch and then say that an angel sent it to him is low. Undeniably low. I had a good opportunity of observing how the thing worked this Christmas, in the case of young Hoodoo McFiggin, the son and heir of the McFiggins, at whose house I board. Hoodoo McFiggin is a good boy, a religious boy. He had been given to understand that Santa Claus would bring nothing to his father and mother because grown-up people don't get presents from the angels. So he saved up all his pocket money and bought a box of cigars for his father and a 75-cent diamond brooch for his mother. His own fortunes he left in the hands of the angels. But he prayed. He prayed every night for weeks that Santa Claus would bring him a pair of skates and a puppy dog and an air gun and a bicycle and a Noah's Ark and a sleigh and a drum. Altogether, about $150 worth of stuff. I went into Hoodoo's room quite early Christmas morning. I had an idea that the scene would be interesting. I woke him up and he sat up in bed, his eyes glistening with radiant expectation, and began hauling things out of his stocking. The first parcel was bulky. It was done up quite loosely and had an odd look generally. Ha ha! Hoodoo cried gleefully as he began undoing it. I'll bet it's the puppy dog all wrapped up in paper. And was it the puppy dog? No, by no means. It was a pair of nice strong number four boots, laces and all, labeled Hoodoo from Santa Claus. And underneath Santa Claus had written, 95 net. The boy's jaw fell with delight. It's boots, he said, and plunged in his hand again. He began hauling away at another parcel with renewed hope on his face. This time the thing seemed like a little round box. Hoodoo tore the paper off it with a feverish hand. He shook it. Something rattled inside. It's a watch and chain! It's a watch and chain! he shouted. Then he pulled the lid off. And was it a watch and chain? No. It was a box of nice brand new celluloid collars, a dozen of them, all alike, and all his own size. The boy was so pleased that you could see his face crack up with pleasure. He waited a few minutes until his intense joy subsided. Then he tried again. This time the packet was long and hard. It resisted the touch and had a sort of funnel shape. It's a toy pistol, said the boy, trembling with excitement. Gee, I hope there are lots of caps with it. I'll fire some off now and wake up father. No, my poor child, you will not wake your father with that. It is a useful thing, but it needs not caps, and it fires no bullets, and you cannot wake a sleeping man with a toothbrush. Yes, it was a toothbrush. A regular beauty, pure bone, all through, and ticketed with a little paper. Hoodoo, from Santa Claus. Again the expression of intense joy passed over the boy's face, and the tears of gratitude started from his eyes. He wiped them away with his toothbrush, and passed on. The next packet was much larger, and evidently contained something soft and bulky. It had been too long to go into the stocking, and was tied outside. I wonder what this is, Hoodoo mused, half afraid to open it. Then his heart gave a great leap, and he forgot all his other presents in the anticipation of this one. It's the drum, he gasped. It's the drum, all wrapped up. Drum nothing. It was pants. A pair of the nicest little short pants. Yellowish-brown short pants. With dear little stripes of color running across both ways. And here again Santa Claus had written, Hoodoo, from Santa Claus, 
one fort net. But there was something wrapped up in it. Oh, yes, there was a pair of braces wrapped up in it. Braces with a little steel sliding thing so that you could slide your pants up to your neck if you wanted to. The boy gave a dry sob of satisfaction. Then he took out his last present. It's a book, he said as he unwrapped it. I wonder if it is fairy stories or adventures. Oh, I hope it's adventures. I'll read it all morning. No, Hoodoo, it was not precisely adventures. It was a small family Bible. Hoodoo had now seen all his presents and he arose and dressed. But he still had the fun of playing with his toys. That is always the chief delight of Christmas morning. First he played with his toothbrush. He got a whole lot of water and brushed all his teeth with it. This was huge. Then he played with his collars. He had no end of fun with them, taking them all out one by one and swearing at them, and then putting them back and swearing at the whole lot together. The next toy was his pants. He had immense fun there, putting them on and taking them off again, and then trying to guess which side was which by merely looking at them. After that, he took his book and read some adventures called Genesis till breakfast time. Then he went downstairs and kissed his father and mother. His father was smoking a cigar, and his mother had her new brooch on. Hoodoo's face was thoughtful, and a light seemed to have broken in upon his mind. Indeed, I think it altogether likely that next Christmas he will hang on to his own money and take chances on what the angels bring. End of Hoodoo McFiggin's Christmas by Stephen Leacock In Bethlehem in Israel this blessed babe was born And laid within a manger upon this blessed morn The witch's mother Mary did nothing take in scorn O tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy O tidings of comfort and joy From God our Heavenly Father a blessed angel came, and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same, how that in Bethlehem was born a Son of God by name. O tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy, O tidings of comfort and joy. Fear not, then said the angel, that nothing you affright. This day is born, O Saviour, of a pure virgin bright, to free all those who trust in him from Satan's power and might. O tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. O tidings of comfort and joy. The shepherds at those tidings rejoiced much in mind, and left their flocks of feeding in tempest, storm, and wind, and went to Bethlehem straight away the Son of God to find. O tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. O tidings of comfort and joy. And when they came to Bethlehem, where our dear Saviour lay, they found him in a manger where oxen feed on hay. His mother Mary kneeling down unto the Lord did pray. O tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. O tidings of comfort and joy. Now to the Lord sing praises, all you within this place, and with true love and brotherhood each other now embrace. This holy tide of Christmas all other doth deface. O tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. O tidings of comfort and joy. God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen, performed for LibriVox.org by D.N. This recording is in the public domain.